Coming up on this Wednesday edition of Newsline at Noon, South Korea's Defense Ministry says North Korea has taken gigantic strides militarily over the past two years and now has the technology to miniaturize nuclear warheads. Crude oil prices tumbled yet again, extending a two-day fall to nearly 10%. Prices have now more than halved in the space of just six months. Plus, around 25,000 jobs in Korea's financial sector have vanished over the last year. The percentage of workers in the sector now stands at a five-year low. These stories are more on Newsline at Noon. It's new Wednesday, January 7th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in. Live from Seoul, I'm Oh Jin Ju. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. We start with the warning from South Korea's Defense Ministry that North Korea now has the technological know-how to miniaturize nuclear warheads. That finding was among a handful of warring military developments in the North that were contained within the ministry's white paper that is published every two years. Connie Kim reports. South Korea says North Korea appears to have made significant advancements in its military capabilities. This in particular in the North's capability to make nuclear warheads small enough to fit on ballistic missiles. Eight years have passed since North Korea carried out its first nuclear test in 2006. Pyongyang's miniaturization of nuclear weapons would appear to have reached a significant level. Seoul's defense ministry says this could be a major threat as nuclear warheads could reach the U.S. mainland if successfully mounted to ballistic missiles. This marks the first time for South Korea's defense ministry to evaluate North Korea's nuclear technology capabilities. South Korea sees more growth in North Korea's ballistic missile technology. Its Tepodong-2 long-range missile is evaluated to have a range of 10,000 kilometers compared to 6,700 kilometers in the past. North Korea's military has also grown by an estimated 10,000 soldiers from 2012 to a total of 1.2 million. Now that's nearly double the size of South Korea's forces. But what's not changed in the latest white paper was South Korea calling North Korea as its, quote, enemy. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And another worrying military development in the north is a cyber army that has gotten much larger in size in recent years. South Korea's defense ministry white paper released on Tuesday says that North Korea now has a near 6,000-member cyber team that is focused on physical and psychological paralysis inside South Korea. Now, this number is double the agents the north had two years ago and almost 10 times bigger than the South Korean military cyber workforce. The vectors have said the long-term goal may be to target telecommunications companies and energy grids in other nations. The new figure comes on the heels of accusations that Pyongyang was involved in the recent hacking on Sony Pictures. North Korea has denied any involvement. Now, North Korea has scolded South Korea for doing nothing to stop a group of North Korean defectors from flying more than half a million anti-Pyongyang leaflets across the border earlier this week. The North state-run Korean Central News Agency on Tuesday urged Seoul to ban the leaflet drive and blame the South for not stepping in to stop the activists. Pyongyang went on to say that improving inter-Korean relations cannot be a one-way street and asked Seoul to clarify that it has the will to engage in sincere dialogue. North Korea is extremely sensitive about the scattering of the leaflets, even going so far as to break an agreement to hold high-level talks with South Korea late last year. With this year marking the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, the United States is calling on Japan to improve and strengthen its relations with its neighbors. This follows Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's comments Monday that he would reflect on Tokyo's past wrongdoings in a fresh statement that will be released in the summer. EGM reports. Heading into 2015, Japan faces a critical year in diplomacy, as this year marks the 70th anniversary of Japan's surrender in World War II. 
U.S. State Department spokesperson Jen Psaki said Tuesday that Japan's heartfelt apology would go a long way. Our view is that the apology is extended by previous Prime Minister Murayama and former Chief Cabinet Secretary Kono marked important chapters in Japan's efforts to improve relations with its neighbors. Former Japanese Prime Minister Domichi Murayama and former Chief Cabinet Secretary Yohei Kono both apologized for Japan's wartime aggression in 1995 and 1993, respectively. The U.S. has been prodding Tokyo to improve its ties with Korea, as Washington wants to strengthen its trilateral alliance in the region to counter China's rise. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said this week that he would, quote, show remorse for Japan's wartime atrocities. That statement will come in August, on occasion of Japan's surrender in the Second World War. However, Abe stopped short of saying whether it would include an actual apology. Japanese public broadcaster NHK reported Wednesday that the government will start working on the statement this month. The team putting it together will include women as well as historians and media personnel. Japan's relations with its neighbors have chilled in recent years, as Japan continues to deny responsibility for its past wartime aggressions. Lee Jun, Arirang News. Global crude prices slumped again on Tuesday, recording a near 10 percent drop in just two days, with U.S. benchmark oil slipping below the psychologically important $50 mark per barrel. This translated into losses for U.S. stocks as well. Kim min -ji has this report. Another oil shock. Global crude prices plummeted to fresh lows on Tuesday over concerns of oversupply and sluggish global growth. U.S. benchmark West Texas Intermediate fell 4.2 percent to about $48 a barrel after dipping below the symbolic threshold of $50 the previous day. Benchmark Brent crude also shed nearly 4 percent to just over $51 per barrel. Both are their lowest levels since the spring of 2009. Crude prices have slumped almost 10 percent this week alone. This comes after Saudi Arabia, the biggest OPEC producer, cut its selling prices in Europe in a move that demonstrates a desire to protect its market share. On Tuesday, Saudi Arabia's King Abdullah said the country will maintain a firm will to deal with the challenges posed by falling crude prices, giving no indication that supplies will be cut. The dip in oil prices translated into losses on Wall Street. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 130 points, or nearly 1 percent, while the S&P 500 also lost about a percent on the back of a sell-off in energy stocks. It was more or less the same in Europe, with markets falling about 1 percent each. Crude prices have been on a downward spiral since June and have lost more than half their value in that time. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Now, despite government policies of making the uh, trying to make the financial industry a major engine of growth, Korea's financial sector keeps contracting. The size of the industry's workforce has fallen to its lowest point since the 2008 global financial crisis. Jim Gill has more. Since the 1997 Asian financial crisis, the government has repeatedly set the ambitious goal of turning Korea into one of Northeast Asia's financial hubs. Yet latest government data shows the industry is in fact shrinking. Over the past 12 months alone, some 24,000 jobs have vanished from the country's financial sector. Statistics Korea said on Wednesday that the number of people working in the industry fell to 840,000, or about 3 percent of Korea's overall workforce. That's down nearly a half a percentage point and the lowest in five years. Despite the government's plans of turning the financial sector into a major growth engine, it only accounts for 5 percent of Korea's GDP, down from 6.5 percent in 2008. Industry experts attribute the decline to poor performances by stock brokerage houses that have been forced to cut back in recent years. Banks and life insurance companies have also sought mergers and acquisitions in the past year as part of restructuring aimed at sharpening their competitiveness. The job market for the financial sector does not look bright this year either. Financial analysts say that although the sector's performance will likely improve this year thanks to a steady economic recovery and the government's deregulation drive, many industry players will have to focus on overhauling their businesses to regain their competitive edge. 
Experts are calling on the government to speed up streamlining red tape to encourage the financial industry to provide funds more easily to the corporate sector and reduce its reliance on providing household loans. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. Korea's Hyundai Motor Group has laid out how much it's going to invest in facilities and R&D over the next few years, and it's not holding back. It's going to plow billions of dollars into that sector of its business. Our Kim Ji-on has the details. Korea's largest automaker, Hyundai Motor Group, plans to devote 73 billion U.S. dollars to facilities and R&D investments from now through 2018. That's around 18 billion dollars a year, a billion dollars more than the government's spending for national R&D investment. 85 percent of that total will go toward improving performance standards and developing hybrids and smart cars. Another 10 billion will be set aside to build the auto group's new business complex on acquire land in the Seoul district of Gangnam. With the investment plan, we aim to raise our brand value and lay the foundation to lead the global market by 2018. An estimated $56 billion or three-quarters of Hyundai's investments will be concentrated in Korea. The company also plans to recruit around 7,400 people during the next four years. The investment plan is expected to help Hyundai Motor and its sister company Kia Motors meet its global sales target of 8.2 million automobiles in 2015. The automakers are estimated to have sold a combined 8 million units globally last year, which would be a record. This despite unfavorable currency conditions and the slow global recovery. Kim Jong, Arirang News. Now, 2014 was a fabulous year for Korea's tourism industry, and this year promises to bring more of the same, if not even better. A report by the Korea Culture and Tourism Institute forecasts that more than 16.2 million tourists will visit Korea in 2015, and that would represent a 14% jump from last year's record high of 14 million. By nationality, Chinese tourists are expected to make up nearly half of all visitors in 2015. The number of Japanese tourists, however, is expected to drop to its lowest point in 12 years, due in large part to the depreciation of the Japanese yen. Well, now we're going to turn our eyes to the rest of the world and join Eunice Kim at the New Centre for the Global Headlines. We are keeping tabs on for you this hour. Mm -hmm. Eunice, uh, there's still no sign of the black box or the tail of the missing air Asia plane, but it's a new day in Indonesia and we understand the recovery effort resumes under better weather conditions. Yeah, it looks like search teams got their break this morning. Weather-wise, at least two divers have entered the waters that have been consistently murky and the current strong. Search teams will look for large pieces of the Down Air Asia airliner that crashed now 11 days ago. A U.S. Navy ship, the USS Fort Worth, participating in the search, has spotted two large metal objects via sonar on Tuesday, so they'll likely try to get to that today. Search teams had salvaged debris like the aircraft seats, safety information cards and the like, but there is still no pickup of the so-called pings from the black box, which has left some experts baffled given that the plane is believed to be in relatively shallow waters between 30 to 40 meters deep. Some opine silt could be blocking the signals from the transmitters. Also on Tuesday, two more bodies were found, bringing the total to 39, still less than a third of the 162 passengers the plane was carrying, most of them Indonesian and three of them Korean. Medical experts warn the bodies not strapped in could begin to sink after 10 days as the clock ticks on the recovery effort. A female suicide bomber has struck a police station in the tourist hub of Sultan Ahmed in Turkey, leaving one officer dead and another wounded. It is the second attack on police in a week, this time near a historic district close to the Blue Mosque and Hagia Sophia Museum. Authorities are working to identify the deceased woman and her motive. No group has claimed responsibility so far. Istanbul's governor told Turkish TV the woman 
reported a lost wallet before detonating herself and that she spoke with a thick accent. And in the United States, Tuesday marked the first day of the 114th Congress. Vice President Joe Biden swore in a batch of new senators as Republicans took control of both chambers of Congress for the first time in eight years. Republican Senator Mitch McConnell became the Senate Majority Leader after holding the Minority Leader post since 2007. Entering his term, he expressed optimism while admitting that hard work laid ahead. At the House of Representatives, John Boehner, you see there, was re-elected to his third term as Speaker and pledged to work with President Barack Obama on issues such as jobs and energy. President Obama congratulated them both and hoped for a productive 2015. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah oh Jin Ju. Korea's rival political parties have agreed on how to compensate the families of the victims of last April's Hyoto Ferry disaster. The bill that was agreed upon on Tuesday features the establishment of a special committee under the Prime Minister's office, which will decide how much each family will receive. The parties decided to first use the 140 million U.S. dollars donated by citizens and businesses when compensating the families and provide additional amounts from state coffers if necessary. The then junior class students of Tanwon High School that saw the most victims in the tragedy will be given extra privileges when they apply for university and a trauma center will be set up to manage their mental health. The rival parties plan to pass the special Toyota Ferry compensation bill at a plenary session next Monday. Now, when couples choose to get married, they're choosing to share a life together. But in Korea, it seems that doesn't necessarily mean they're choosing to share household chores. Shin Se-min explains. A long-lasting, healthy and happy marriage requires work, real work. But in Korea, at least, most of that work in the home is being done by women. A report from Statistics Korea includes data on the distribution of home chores among heterosexual marriage couples above the age of 20 in 12 different countries. Using data from the International Social Survey program, the survey took six different tasks into account, including grocery shopping, cooking, cleaning, and caring for family members who are ill. Discrepancies could be seen between in the participation rates in each of the 12 countries surveyed. But Korean husbands were second to last in terms of pulling their own weights behind only their Japanese counterparts. Compared to European hubbies, Korean male spouses did just about half the amount of housework. The Korean Women's Development Institute attributes this indifference among Korean husbands to help out at home to the traditional gender roles that are deeply rooted in society. However, they added that the times are changing, and so too should Korean husbands, especially with more women now working outside the home in jobs of their own. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The fiercest battleground for global TV manufacturers this year is going to be Asia, with the market expected to grow significantly. Market research firm Display Search says the TV market is forecast to see an annual growth rate of 3.2 percent worldwide in 2015. The researcher forecasts Japan to have the highest growth rate at nearly 11 percent, attributing that to the country's aging population who spend more time watching TV. Now, the TV market the market of the Asia-Pacific region is projected to grow 7 percent, more than double the global average. On the other hand, the television market in the U.S. is only forecast to grow half a percent this year. The world's biggest tech brands are in Las Vegas for the 2015 Consumer Electronics Show, from intelligent cars to high-tech TVs. Our Connie Lee walks us through the hottest trends at this year's event. It's one of the world's biggest tech gadget fairs, involving about 3,600 companies. 
The Consumer Electronics Show is currently underway in Las Vegas. More than 150,000 tech heads are set to visit for a first look at the next big thing. So what are some of the trends this year? It looks like some high-tech TVs are playing a big role. 4K TVs, otherwise known as Ultra HD televisions, may go mainstream this year. They're defined by their displays, which have four times the resolution as their HD counterparts. Both LG and Samsung are presenting a number of these models at the show, including Samsung's new Tizen-powered curved 4K TV. And how about some autonomous connected cars? The autonomous car will be a big topic at CES. All the major auto manufacturers come to this show. They come here to show off the ways in which their cars are working with your smartwatch, with your phone. Major automakers like Mercedes-Benz and BMW are displaying their latest intelligent cars. Wearable and smart devices will also take center stage. Hundreds of companies will show off their latest wearable products, including different accessories designed to work with the devices. The growth of 3D printers, robotics, and drones will also be a hot trend this year, with the buzz phrase, the Internet of Things, being one of the major themes. The Internet of Things is a really general term that stands in for devices talking to each other without you across the Internet. The international CES is set to run through Friday. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Now, researchers at Oxford University have begun human testing of a new Ebola vaccine. According to the BBC, the trial is being conducted on 72 volunteers between the ages of 18 and 50 who will receive a second booster shot one or two months after their first. Initial testing on monkeys provided complete protection against the Ebola virus. The developer of this vaccine, Johnson & Johnson, said it hopes to begin a larger trial in Africa and Europe within three months and have the vaccine ready for use in the West African countries ravaged by Ebola by the end or by the middle of the year rather. The World Health Organization says more than 8,000 people have been killed since the outbreak began last year. And a mysterious and terrifying epidemic is gripping a small village in rural Kazakhstan. Hundreds of people have been randomly falling asleep and staying asleep for hours, even days on end. And what's even more worrying is that no one really knows what's causing it. Guan Sua reports. One in five residents in a small village in Kazakhstan have been randomly falling asleep, including these children, barely able to keep their balance and then dozing off. The first case was registered in spring 2013, and what started out affecting only a handful of patients has increased to several hundred people. I was on my way home from school when I stumbled and fell asleep. My friend helped me up and took me home. Then I can't remember. Patients have been falling asleep in the middle of the day at school, work or on the street. Some could not be woken up for days, some even for a whole week. When they wake up, they suffer from drowsiness, memory loss and even hallucinations. Doctors say many patients have brain edema, a state in which excessive fluid causes swelling in the brain. All the kids had a CT scan. There is a diffuse brain edema, but there is no deterioration in terms of neurological symptoms. There is no sign of meningitis. This is why Kazakhstan's health ministry says it has ruled out a virus or bacterial infection. Many believe the condition is linked to steam seeping out of an unused uranium mine in the area, but experts could not find any evidence. Terrified of this mysterious epidemic, almost three quarters of the village's residents have agreed to pack up and leave. Kwon Soa, Arirang News.
Well, be sure to dress extra warmly before heading out today. It's bright and beautiful looking out of the window, but it's freezing outside. I mean, even right now, the sensory temperature is below minus 10 here in the capital. In the meantime, people in the east are suffering from dry weather. An advisory is still in place over there, and cold wave advisory was issued in parts of Gyeonggi-do and Gangwon-do provinces. Now, mostly sunny skies are in store, but it will not help much to boost of the temperatures as the daily high here in the capital will only peak at minus two, while Daegu and Gwangju should both rise to uh, three, and Busan will reach six this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island will rise to five, while Daejeon and Dukdo will be getting up to one and two, respectively. Now, tomorrow will be as cold as today, so be sure to stay bundled up until Friday, uh, when the cold snap will finally start to break, and readings will then bounce back to the seasonal averages just in time for the weekend. Well, that's all I have for you today, and let's send it back to Mark and Jinju in the studio. Well, thank you ever so much as always, Gian, for the weather, and those are the stories we're following at this hour. Join Mark and I at the same time on Thursday. Thank you for watching.